During the course of my career in software development, I've been fortunate to have worked with lots of different technologies. One of the things that I value about this is that it gives me a perspective that I think allows me to see commonalities and patterns that may otherwise be easy to miss. There are some fundamentals to our work, whatever the problem, whatever the technology, that seem really important to our ability to do a good job. And then, being fairly old, I see people miss those important ideas when something new comes along. For example, version control really matters, whatever it is that you're doing. One of the fields that I see making this kind of mistake at the moment is in data management and the closely related field of machine learning. So how should we manage data at scale? And what lessons can we apply from broader software engineering? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. This episode is sponsored by Equal Experts, who have written a playbook on data pipelining. It helps you to understand how to get the right data to the right place at the right time to the right people to do useful work. In this episode, I want to explore some of the essentials for dealing with data and point out some of the missteps that I think data scientists and other data professionals sometimes make. Let's start with the basics. This may sound like I'm stating the obvious, but we work with information technology. These are the tools that allow us to create and manipulate information. So our medium, the material that we manipulate, is information. It is through that information that we deliver or shape that ultimately we add value to our users and to the people that employ us. I think it helps sometimes to remember that information is defined as data plus meaning. There are different kinds of information that we manipulate. Our code is information too, but in this context today, we're talking about the information that our systems manipulate. It's data. Actually, data is really the wrong word because there is nearly always meaning associated with it. So it's information, really. At this point, I'm imagining you wondering if I've had a few too many glasses of wine before recording this episode or have been smoking the wrong stuff. My point here is that there are lots of common, helpful ideas available to us if we think in these terms. Ideas that are just as applicable to data storage, manipulation, or even machine learning as they are to what we may think of as more conventional code-based systems. Let's imagine some information existing in a computer somewhere, and we'd like to do something with it. So we need to get the information from where it is now to, to a place where we can use it. We need to move it from A to B. There are a number of things that have to happen to achieve that result. The information needs to be identified in some way, retrieved from where it is stored, translated into a form that makes sense for it to be moved, moved from A to B and then translated into a form that means B can make use of it. This is true whatever the nature of the information. This is just as true of a single byte as it is for all of the training data for a machine learning algorithm. Some of the steps may be more complex if the data is big, but the steps are the same. Now let's think about the things that can go wrong. What happens if the original source was corrupted or A crashed? We can no longer get the information. So we probably need to make a copy and keep it somewhere safe. I hear anecdotally that many data scientists often work in Jupyter notebooks that they don't back up. Oops, no copy here. So let's go back to A and B and imagine that in the process of sending this information, some of it got lost or maybe scrambled in transmission. Again, this is still true of a byte or a terabyte. It's just 10 to the 12 times more likely to happen for a terabyte. So we need to be able to detect a problem and we have, have to have some strategy to fix it when we find it. 
This is a much more difficult problem when dealing with megabytes, gigabytes and terabytes, but unless we want our information to revert to merely data that now lacks meaning altogether, we need to worry about it. So how do we detect leaks or corruption in our information flows, our data pipelines? How do we mitigate against them? If it doesn't arrive intact, ultimately the last resort is to go back and send the information again. That means that we need to store the original somewhere. Lots of organisations with big data needs don't do this. They will work on and modify data in place, leaving them no real option to recover. One of the lessons that we learned in software development is to prefer additive changes to data so that we don't lose any information on our journey. And to make changes in small controlled steps so that we can step back to a stable point if we make a mistake. This gets us to one of the elephants in the room that I've already mentioned, version control. If we're changing things, then we should keep track of the changes. We software developers mostly learnt this lesson a very long time ago. It is fortunately now exceedingly rare to find people working in code without version control. Unfortunately, the same thing is not true for people dealing with data. In fact, the reverse is true, even for the simple cases, even for the code that deals with that data. Code that to manipulate that data is often treated as essentially throwaway, even when it has grown to become complex and useful. It's rarely well structured or well designed because the people working on it don't have or at least don't value those skills. The tools that support the migration and transformation of data are often naive and simplistic in their support or lack of support for the basics of development techniques. Not supporting or making it difficult to add version control, for example. And making it difficult to sensibly structure solutions in a way that helps to manage the complexity of the problems that they are meant to solve. I once worked on a project that used one of these tools, a market leader at the time. It was built on the assumption that we would be dynamically changing the configuration of our system live in production. There was no support for testing our changes offline in a safer environment first. No ability to version our changes and so store a safe, stable configuration somewhere that we could step back to if we made a mistake. Not even any support for making a copy of the changes. They were stored in a dedicated custom database. We were expected to remember any change we made to our production system and manually reverse out of it if it was a mistake. These days, in software development, this sounds ludicrous and unprofessional. That's because it is. But this is how many of these expensive enterprise class data management tools actually work. The result of this combination of factors is really pretty unpleasant. We have people who don't think of their primary focus as software, using tools that are outdated in concept and duck the difficult parts of the problem, managing copies of information in multiple places. They're dealing with massive volumes of often complex, messy data, without proper tool support or the experience to be worried about the right things. They've fallen into the same traps that we did in the early days of our discipline, and they've fallen back on re onto really traditional, failed approaches to building information systems. One of these failed approaches is the one model to rule them all approach. Data people will often talk in terms of data warehouses or data lakes. But the lure here is the same that software development teams faced as systems grew. What's the model? It's the idea that there is one canonical perfect model in the information. In a big system, we will have multiple data sources flowing information to somewhere where we can shape it to answer useful questions. The bigger this model grows, the less likely we will be able to do this. What does a book mean to Amazon? It's not a simple question to answer, because it depends on the context. Some parts of selling books is about authors, some parts about the contents, some about the price, some are about the location that you want to send it to because somebody's bought it. 
Modeling this kind of thing matters at the level of data as well as at the level of code. For a very long time, people have attempted to build canonical models, decades, that represented ideas like these all bundled together. It's never really worked. Modern software design is more distributed than this, more locally focused and targeted. We've learned that to cope with the scale of the problems that we now deal with, we must compartmentalize them. One of the tools that we can wield to do this is the idea of bounded contexts. Eric Evans came up with bounded contexts in his Domain Driven Design book uh, over a decade ago. It allows us to subdivide a problem space into different areas of interest. Ideas within a bounded context are more closely related to one another than ideas outside, even when they represent the same concept. A book in an inventory control system is different to a book in a search for new books system. This is deeply important if we are to manage complexity in the information systems that we deal with. So modern thinking on data also thinks about how to subdivide the information space, how to compartmentalize the data that is the material on which analysis operates. People have begun talking about ideas like data mesh, where we actively design the data that we expect to be useful for analytical purposes. This is a more effective than trying to attempt to build some global perfect pool of data on which we can do any analysis for any unforeseen purpose. It also means that because we're thinking of this as information rather than only raw data, we can know that there is some meaning associated with it. So we can imagine being able to validate it and generally exert better control over it. In my book on software engineering, I talk about the central importance of managing complexity. I describe several organizing principles that I think are pretty much universal. So unsurprisingly, I think that they apply to data in, in, and information as much as to what we'd think more conventionally of as software. We need to compartmentalize our systems and our data so that we can understand them in smaller pieces, rather than trying to synthesize some giant, all-conquering model of everything. We need to make progress in small steps so that we can learn and test our ideas as we learn. One of the recommendations in Equal Experts Data Pipelines playbook is to establish what they call a steel thread. If you are integrating data sources with each other or with services that do analysis on their information, start simply. Build the most trivial or simple implementation that you can think of. Work the bugs out of it iteratively until it's solid. <clears throat> Create this steel thread from which you can now hang other things. I'd say the same about introducing a new service or a subsystem. Start simply and refine rather than trying to build something complex from the outset. We succeed by incrementally growing complex systems, not by establishing them with one giant leap. Even Neil Armstrong's giant leap was actually the fruit of seven years of incremental learning and experimentation. Modern information systems are complex things, whether built by teams of programmers or data professionals. The ideas of how to deal with complex digital information have grown over time and with experience. It's rather foolish to ignore these lessons. It's certainly true that we may need to apply some different tools to deal with the differences that the scale of the information in data-oriented systems pre presents to us. But I think that the problems are much more closely related than we often think. The fundamentals of finding ways to work in small version controlled steps, organizing our work so that we can make incremental progress, stepping forward on success and stepping back from failure, and of working to actively manage the complexity of the information that we deal with is essential to doing a good job, whatever the nature of the information. Thank you for watching.